Don Mazzella here for Small Business Digest. And, you know, uh, there's always um, a, a critical element to uh, uh, anything uh, an, uh, an organizational leader um, needs to do. And that thing is to um, make sure other people un um, know that he or she is committed to the process. We have with us today Ken Chapman. He's got an interesting approach to this. And when I heard about it, we had to have on the program. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you, Don. It's very good to be here. Well, as we ask all our guests, first, tell us a little bit about yourself, then about your company and your book, which I'm told by the people who, who know better than me, that's a great book, and finally, a website. Very good. Well, the, the book, Safety Beyond the Numbers, focuses on that gap but that most organizations realize somewhere along the way. They put in place with the very best of intentions and at considerable expense, a robust compliance program that compares well to OSHA standards as well as to industry standards. And after having done everything they can imagine they can do, they still have people getting hurt. So our book addresses that next step. And by that next step, I mean, what do you do when the company's done all that it can do? Where do you go from there to achieve zero incidents, zero safety incidents in your workplace? And our book says, our, makes the argument that ownership, individual ownership is the next step. Couldn't agree with you more, but before we go further, Ken, tell us a little bit about your background. So, uh, so why people should uh, read this book? Well, uh, I spent a short period of time as a professor, and from there, I went into private practice as an industrial psychologist. We have focused for more than 40 years on heavy industry, primarily places like steel mills, foundries, paper mills, uh, generating stations, uh, steel fabrication. And we, we chose early to focus on those industries because most folks uh, in our profession, industrial, organizational psychology, weren't interested. They were more interested in blank banks and insurance companies. So we've uh, spent uh, more than 40 years focused on heavy industry and safe outcomes in those organizations. Okay. So uh, what's the name of your book, and can you show us a copy? Absolutely. The title of the book is Safety Beyond the Numbers, a, and subtitled A Path to Principled Leadership. And Safety Beyond the Numbers simply takes note of moving beyond focused on what your recordable or dark rate is to looking beyond that to what else can be done, which is individual ownership. Well, before we go further, uh, let me ask you this question. You, you concentrate on heavy industry, but it's always been my uh, understanding, these wise um, post-war period, that these industries have concentrated on trying to make safety an issue, um, a concern. Am I right in that or? Uh, well, you're right. Uh, in, in fact, <clears throat> While we focused on heavy industry, we've also worked in everything from insurance companies to, to banks, to sales organizations of one kind. And of course, uh, the, and of course also focused on places like distribution centers and anywhere that people work. But yes, in heavy industry, there's been a particular strong, particularly strong emphasis on safety for quite a long time now. Uh, going back long before OSHA was uh, became the law in 1971 and a reality in 72, heavy industry has worked for a long time, and in many ways, it has been able to accomplish what compliance can accomplish. That is, it has in place good, safe work practices, very good protocols like lockout, tagout. And the training that's done around these particular concepts of safe work practices and lockout tagout are outstanding in many settings. The issue arises when you put this money, this time, this effort 
into developing these programs, which must be done, and discover that they have limits. So what our book addresses is the limits. But I want to be very clear about something, Don. What's in the book concerning culture and ownership will not work until you have a robust compliance program in place. Because the robust compliance program is the company's side of the equation. But once that's in place, it's necessary to turn your attention to what the team member or employee's side of the equation is. Because at the end of the day, every employee's best defense against being harmed in the workplace is their own good judgment. I'll share with you a statistic that many of our listeners probably are already aware of, and that is that nine out of 10 safety incidents occur when a member of management is not around. That means 90% of the time when someone gets hurt, there's no supervisor, there's no manager uh, lurking about. So if there's going to be a safe outcome in that instance, that decision to have a safe outcome has to be made by the employee themselves. That's in a nutshell what we mean by ownership. So uh, let me carry it back to you to make sure I understand. You're saying, in fact, you, you, you concentrate on convincing the employee and the manager to, to be on their toes 100% of the time. Am I? Yes. Uh, the company has to do its part. That's management's part. It has to establish safe work practices. It has to have a, a strong lockout tagout program has to have a good training program, and it must be diligent in searching for new hazards. Safety on the part of the company never gets done. It's always getting done. But once the company has those efforts clearly in place, it must turn its attention to what the employee's part of this equation is. For example, here's a story we hear over and over again. My company has a robust compliance program. We have excellent safe work practices. We teach them. We have a lockout, tag out process and protocol that is non-negotiable. And yet our people are still getting hurt. And they're still getting hurt because after the company has done everything it can reasonably be expected to do, one employee at any moment can cancel out all their efforts and they can cancel out those efforts by simply choosing not to follow a safe work practice, choosing not to take ownership of their own safety. One of the things that we do to help move the ball toward ownership is helping the employees themselves maintain what we call perspective. Human nature tends to see life in terms of what's immediately in front of me and often sees life in terms of this moment is all about me. Mm -hmm. But we simply help employees connect with the reason that they are there to start with. And the reason they're in the workplace to start with is not for the company. And every company should acknowledge that and I would argue be grateful for it. It's called healthy self-interest. Hmm. Every employee comes through the gate for what their efforts inside the gate will buy for the people they care about outside the gate. And in teaching the concept or perspective, as it's explained in the book, we simply help us. Uh, the, the, the message in the book simply enables the employee as a strategy for their own well-being to maintain perspective, to remember that the moment in which they're working, the day in which they're engaged is not just about them. It's about the people that they care about outside the gate, and therefore they must be willing to make the decisions that enable them to go on home as healthy and whole as, as when they arrived. And to be able to do that every day 
because their ability to work is their greatest financial asset. What we find as we have uh, conducted various seminars and work with various companies is that most employees find this an innovative or new thought. Now, I don't think it's something, I don't think that it's something that never occurred to them. I think that it's more about something that they had never been invited to embrace as a valid position to take because it's so easy to get lost in the moment. But we have found hourly employees very receptive to the idea that we know you're not here first and foremost for the company. You're here first and foremost for the people that are outside the gate. So maintaining perspective, making sure you go home healthy and whole every day is your greatest gift to them and to the future you want them to have. Well, that's a, that's a great approach. I don't see how anybody could uh, uh, argue with that. Well, we've had good success with it uh, in those environments in which it has been tried and, and been made uh, essential. It's, uh, it's worked well. Do you have a website? Uh, we do. Uh, SafePath.Solutions uh, is the website. Uh, Can you spell it out for our audience? S-A-F-E-P-A-T-H dot solutions. S-O-L-U. T I O N S SafePath dot solutions dot com. Uh, no, it's dot solutions. Oh, um, really? Not a, not a dot com. Oh, okay. SafePath dot solutions. Okay, but no, 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 let's examine this a little further because it's interesting. Um, you know, uh, someone comes uh, is getting a divorce and comes to work. I mean, you can't. Uh, uh, he can't. He or she can't be one hundred percent focused on the job. I mean, uh, well, the, thank you, uh, Don. Uh, you have just identified one of the reasons that our approach has been so effective. The best and the brightest, the best employee you have, the employee with the best safety record, can have a bad day. Anyone can arrive at work on any given day and be distracted by the things they care about outside the gate. For example, a divorce, as you, you took note of, or a sick child, or an elderly parent, or a terminally ill uh, spouse. Uh, all of those things can, in, in the book, we tell the story of, about a fatality that happened as the result of a, uh, an employee who was distracted by thoughts of his daughter's wedding, as tragic as that is. So we, we have a process that helps to address that. And that process is captured in two concepts. One, we want employees to make it safe to keep me safe. And safe to keep me safe means this, that no matter who I am, if someone says to me, Ken, you need to put your hard hat on, the only appropriate response from me is to put my hard hat on and say thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in many work settings, it's uh, acceptable for people to uh, give gestures to each other that are uh, counterproductive or to respond in some sort of sarcastic way that says, who are you to remind me to put my PPE on? But our philosophy is that you want a culture in which everyone makes it safe to keep me safe. Everyone believes from their personal experience that they are not going to pay a price for reminding me to put my, my safety glasses on. Hmm. That I'm going to respond in only one way, put my glasses on and say thank you. The second concept is, that, that addresses the question that you raised is this. I will never trade your safety for my comfort or your approval. I will live up to my highest opinion of me. I'll be a good neighbor. And when I say I will never trade your safety for my comfort or your approval, this is what I mean. I'll never refuse to speak up just because it makes me uncomfortable. 
and I'll never refuse to speak up just because you may be angry with me because I did. And those two strategies have been very predictive and reliable in addressing the concerns around the employee who shows up distracted on any given day because they're distracted by things that are important to them, the very reasons that they're at work to start with. Hmm. Well, I'm going to throw a curveball at you uh, now, Ken, uh, because this came up a couple, a couple of weeks ago. Um, in, in this polarized society, um, uh, black, white, et cetera, uh, there seems to be a, a growing trend where one side will not take what you're saying, uh, safety requirements or direction from the other side. And we're, we're seeing that uh, I, I ran into it at a, uh, a major distribution center that I happen to have visited uh, for another purpose. And th th their problem is that they can't get the employees to work together. And mm. that part of the problem is that if, if a, one employee, even though they're a manager, says to another employee, do something, the other employee says, who are you to make me do it? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because companies are notorious about allowing what we call the indispensable outlier to remain in the organization. I want to say upfront and clearly that any organization that adopts our strategy of safety ownership will have to make their peace with this fact. Not everyone will be able to remain in the organization because in the dynamic you just described, there's almost always someone who is that outlier, that person who is viewed as indispensable, therefore making them an indispensable outlier. It's acceptable for them to poison the water because they're considered so productive. It's acceptable for them to be disruptive. And as long as that individual is in the organization, and it can be more than one because they often produce or develop people like themselves. As long as that person is in the organization, our process will not work. They have to leave. And the only people who can remain are those who are committed to living up to their highest opinion of themselves and the highest of interest of the common good. And many organizations find it very difficult to do that. But here's what I've found. In 40 years of doing this, here's what I've discovered. I've never seen an exception. That very person that is an indispensable outlier, they're coloring outside the lines, playing outside the rules, and they're thought to be a person we can't do without. When that person leaves, everything gets better. But because here's what they do. That individual creates what we call a prairie dog town. They create an environment in which everybody digs a burrow and they get in that burrow and they try to stay off the indispensable outliers radar. And they poke their head up just long enough uh, every hour or two to find out what they need to know. And then they get back in their burrow. Their job, their goal is not to do their job to their best. Their goal is to survive, hmm. to keep their job. But once that indispensable outlier is gone, people poke their head up out of their burrow. They discover it's safe to contribute. They begin contributing. And over time, they actually fill in the burrow. <laughs> they stay out and work as a team. Uh, that's one of the essential strategies the company has to be willing to address if it is going to create a safer work culture, go beyond the numbers indicated in compliance. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, the dangerous industries, offshore uh, oil rigs, uh, uh, methane plants, et cetera. Uh, if if I'm and I, I'm I'm going by memory more than anything else, right? They basically have better safety records 
than um, uh, more mundane industries and be, because they emphasize teamwork, etc. Cetera. But um, how did the, I'm going to, can you, how did, how did that, that work into your framework and why is that the case? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's very much to the point of the whole book. And that is that those organizations are more successful in creating what uh, is sometimes called the burning platform, which is not used in the oil rig industry quite as much anymore because of recent events. But historically, the burning platform meant this. We're on an island. All we have is each other. Here's what we've got to do to all get on that uh, helicopter and go back home in 30 days or 60 days, whatever the case may be. Because of that isolation, because of the obvious nature of it, it's a little easier to get people vested in each other's best interest. And that's an important human dynamic. Uh, what's different is that in most settings, people are going to go home at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, I'm going to walk away from the person that uh, I, I shot a bird to <laughs> mm. uh, when they told me to put my heart hat on. Yeah, but, but an oil rig, you're not going home at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, you're going to see that guy several more times during the day, and tomorrow, and next week, and on and on and on. And you very quickly can make sense out of this concept on an oil rig. You can very quickly make sense out of it. I will never trade your safety for my comfort or your approval. You can make say, sense out of this very quickly. I better make it safe for people to keep me safe. Uh, the sense of urgency pushes people toward their healthy self-interest and perspective in a way that other environments often don't. Um, your book again for, for people? Safety Beyond the Numbers. Well, let me ask you this question. As more and more women have gotten into more and more fields, have they eased this uh, concept or made it more difficult to uh, Im implement? W women make a contribution to the workplace that's unique from men in, in many different ways, but the challenge remains the same. The, the, the need to make sense out of things, the need to be valued, the need to have a sense of purpose is not unique to any gender. Uh, it, it is the human condition. And just like men can lose perspective, so can women. Just like men can be distracted, women can be distracted. The, my co-author, Tony Orlowski, who has been a working general manager and executive vice president in heavy industry for about 25 years, uh, I think Tony would tell you that uh, women are a little quicker to demonstrate compassion and goodwill for others. There's a little less of a macho fact, uh, factor there. Uh, but in terms of working safely, the same challenges remain. Hmm. Well, um, this, this is a fascinating interview for me. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, um, I, you know, we all see the, uh, the North Sea, the Alaskan Sea, uh, um, um, crab fishermen, that series out there, yes. which, which is um, my, uh, and uh, what, what always amazes me that the, the crews can fight together but work together. But, um, I mean, it's kind of dangerous out there. Yes, is, are there, um, certain industries where it's more important to do that than others, or and they're all important, but uh. Are there any where the external factors really push the necessity? Well, sure. Uh, for example, uh, in a foundry where you have uh, uh, molten steel or iron or aluminum, uh, whatever the case may be, the potential risk, of course, are higher. But that doesn't mean that those have to be unsafe work environments. It simply means that safe work practices and the pro appropriate protocols have to be in place and have to be followed with great fidelity. And there are many foundries who 
go months, sometimes a year without a recordable. And that happens because of their commitment to these safe work practices and protocols, which they put in place. But in terms of how dangerous a work environment is, at the end of the day, that is a function of the company's indifference to safety and or the employee's lack of ownership of their own safety. Can any company today be um, ignore safety in this day and age? I don't think so. Uh, in fact, uh, our experience is that there's there's more likely to be a negative consequence. And, and I want to be very careful here, Don. Anytime someone is hurt in the workplace, the person who is hurt the most is the person who's injured and their families, particularly if they are killed or disabled in some way. That's the person who is hurt the most. But there is also a cost for the company. And that cost from the company is greater and more significant than ever for the reason uh, that you and I are demonstrating right now. The ability to communicate quickly and cleanly through the internet, social media, uh, companies pay a high price if they get on the wrong side of social media because of a safety issue. I think we're seeing that rather uh, clearly right now because of some events that took place recently in Ohio. Mm. There was an explosion at a plant. The internet is, is just littered with both true and false stories about that event, but they both have the same impact. Whether the story is true or false, the company's reputation has been damaged substantially. Ken, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the day. Your book again, where people can get it? Safety Beyond the Numbers. And the, the website is safepath.solutions, not .com. The book is available at Amazon and Apple. It's available in print as an ebook and as an audible. Mm -hmm. Safety Beyond the Numbers by Ken Chapman and Tony Orlowski. Well, Ken, you have just about a minute left. What would you like to leave our audience with? I'd like to leave your audience with this thought that you don't have to settle. You don't have to settle for a workplace where people do get hurt despite your best efforts. You can have a workplace where no one ever gets hurt. It can happen, but you got to have a robust compliance program in place and you got to add to that team member employee ownership people taking responsibility for making the good decisions you've taught them to make well on that note ken chapman we say thank you for for me a very illuminating uh, time together thank you